horses versus birds. Uh, it's very kind of very kind of to allow me to talk about birds uh, in this session. Uh, I'd like to justify to you why I, I, I want to talk about using machine learning to analyse bird sounds, because um, it's not a very common thing to be doing. Um, in, in the UK and elsewhere, birds, bird populations have been in serious decline since the 1970s. This is largely because of uh, land management practices, but it's also possibly related to climate change, and there's a lot of good reasons that we want to monitor this. There is a new button. It's working. It's working, but we can't hear anything. Good. <laughs> so, um, uh, yes, so there's, the, the, there's real motive to, to monitor bird populations. Um, and uh, we can do this traditionally. We can, uh, for example, use volunteers to go out and monitor birds. We can also, uh, that doesn't scale very well, we can also put, uh, we, we can, uh, put tracking devices on birds or just uh, identification rings. The problem with that is that it's intrusive and it can, uh, it can affect the birds' behaviour and their lifestyles. The great thing is that birds can be most commonly observed by sound. So for someone who works with uh, sound and computer analysis, this is a great opportunity. Um, much easier than uh, spotting birds by vision. So, uh, uh, fantastic. Here, here we go. We're going we're to do birds instead of horses, because you can spot horses visually quite easily. I'm going to talk about two main things. Uh, I'm going to talk about classification-based approaches to bird sound. That's not the only way you can approach bird sound. Um, the main things I'm going to talk about are bird sound detection. Maybe I will use a stick. I wonder if this suits. Here we go. So I'm mostly going to be talking about bird sound detection and then about individual ID. Uh, but before I get on to those, uh, just a, a, a quick story. So in 2014, we, create, we created uh, an approach to automatic classification of bird sounds. So bird species, sorry. This is, um, uh, so the first thing we worked on and we got great results. So this was in the test um, among 500 different, classes, different species of bird from Brazil. Um, we got great results, quite happy with it. That gave us the confidence to go out and make an app. Um, so, so this is available, it's called Warbler. And, uh, this is, it's, at the moment it's for the UK only, uh, but it's, it's really nice. So you record 10 seconds of bird sound, submits it to the system, and it tells you what bird it thinks it is. Um, and this, for us, it's a lovely tool for engagement in uh, nature, engagement with sound around you. Uh, and we have loads of people uh, taking it up. Uh, the uh, unexpected thing is what your users do with the software you give them. Um, kind of encapsulated in this tweet, which is that someone tested the Warbler app on the squeaky office photocopier <laughs> uh, and found out that there's either a Willow Warbler or a great spotted woodpecker inside. <laughs> so, uh, I'm, I'm going to emphasise that the app works it works well for birds, it just doesn't work that well for photocopiers, but uh, we don't get to control what the user does with the, with the app. But you know, that, that's a lesson for automatic classification and uh, what you expect at the inputs. Um, having made this, uh, this, this app and done this work on automatic bird recognition, I did get quite a lot of people coming to me who were ecologists, for example, or working for conservation organisations. They have a lot of need for this kind of thing. Um, in particular because there's, uh, there's, there's a large number of projects that have these automatic uh, recorders. You can't quite see it. This is, this is a little box with microphones on it stuck to a tree. Um, and there are plenty of these projects now that will record large amounts of bird sound, well, large amounts of environmental sound. They want to detect birds, they want to monitor which birds are in the, in the area. Um, so, they can use off-the-shelf methods, but they're not very robust. Um, the, the worst thing for, f from the practitioner's point of view is that they don't quite know how to take this uh, off-the-shelf algorithm and make it work for their case, because uh, it needs all kinds of fiddling. You need to know uh, what it means to choose the number of states in a hidden Markov model. And for practitioners, it's actually really obscure how to um, take an off-the-shelf algorithm and use it for their situation. So inspired by that, uh, and inspired by some of our experience with bird classification before, we designed um, a challenge, a data challenge, where we publish data sets and we challenge research teams around the world to come up with um, a, an approach to solve the problem. Um, 
And this is for bird detection. Okay, so uh, I'm not talking about species classification now, but more like a, a binary classification task. If we've got some audio, are there birds in this little chunk of audio? Uh, and so what we did, this is, this is how you run the data challenge. You publish some data that people can use to develop or to train their algorithm, and then you have some private data that's going to be the data that they're going to be tested on, their algorithms are going to be evaluated on. Um, for the uh, public data, we had some, uh, we have lots of recordings, mobile phone recordings from the Warbler app. We also had <coughs> other crowdsourced field recordings. Uh, and the testing set was very different. So the testing set was from a remote monitoring project in the Chernobyl exclusion zone. So those boxes nailed to trees that I just uh, showed you. The recordings in the test set were from this kind of uh, scenario. So the training and the testing sets differ in so many ways. They differ in um, uh, the location, the recording equipment, the, the species that are present are different. Okay, So dramatic differences here. The background sound is different, the class balance is different. It's, it's, it's justifiable to ask, how is a classifier meant to do a good job at this? Especially when you think of like what is the class of bird sounds like? It's a very diverse, very heterogeneous class. Um, and it's a reasonable question to ask, but on, on the other hand, this is, this is, the, <laughs> this is in practice what's going to happen. So we're going to have, uh, whatever you do with your algorithm, if it's going to be practically useful, you're going to give it to an ecologist, and they're going to take it to somewhere where, for example, they don't know the class balance. This is the question they're trying to answer. How many birds are there in, in this particular forest? So we try to make a difficult question, uh, with a, a difficult task, but with a common question. The common question between these two data sets is, given a chunk of audio, are there birds in it? Uh, 30 teams submitted. We got uh, a really gratifyingly good performance. So um, all of the stats I'm going to show you in this talk are based on area under the curve AUC measure, which uh, we find useful for various reasons. 89% um, uh, area under the curve is pretty good. And uh, there are some strategies that people use to, 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 to make the classifier adapt to, to the new conditions. Um, actually, something that was particularly uh, notable from my point of view, so the domain, domain adaptation, these are just the top, uh, top scoring teams. Uh, not all of the top scoring teams actually needed to use the domain adaptation. It's really encouraging because uh, it, it suggests that uh, to some extent the, the general, generalizability <coughs> of these, these methods is, is actually getting there. I mean, it's, it's really uh, much better than I was expecting. Uh, it made me wonder, why do we evaluate things using match conditions? It happens so much of the time in, in, in the kind of research that we do. Um, one thing we can argue is that it's, it's very useful to study the classifier's behaviour by sort of, uh, excluding extraneous uh, factors. And yeah, great. Um, sometimes a practical application does have match conditions, so you might take this, uh, let's say we've got 500 hours of birdsong recordings and we can't annotate it all. But we, maybe we can annotate half an hour and then use that to annotate the rest. In that, that's kind of a match condition scenario where the training set and the actual application might match. Um, but I'm kind of wondering if it's, it's actually, in, uh, in most cases, a more of a pragmatic thing. It's difficult to get hold of uh, data sets that you can really that you can really do this, uh, this mismatched, mismatched conditions testing on uh, reasonably? Or is it because the algorithms aren't good enough and you can't get, uh, uh, you can't at this point in, in, in development get uh, good enough results to, to really inspect them? And so with uh, the, the classic uh, machine learning workflow, you would be train, you, have, you validate and you test, and a lot of the time it's um, the, 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 the testing phase is on data with match conditions, uh, but really, I mean, there's, there's another step which is really testing, and that's, uh, in, uh, that's often when you, you, someone else tries to take your algorithm uh, and apply it for themselves and finds that it doesn't get the 80-something uh, percent area under the curve that uh, you uh, implicitly promised that it might. Um, wouldn't it be nice if we could do that ourselves? Maybe, maybe we should just encourage more ma mismatched conditions testing in, uh, in the reporting of these things so, uh, so that we can get an idea of, more of an idea of the generalizability. Um, so that's the first, uh, 
first half of the, the, the talk that I wanted to talk about. So that was about bird detection. Um, another thing that people come to me to talk about is identifying individual birds. Again, this is, uh, this is important for monitoring bird populations, but also for answering scientific questions about birds, um, uh, some about their behavior, for example. Um, this is often done by uh, putting an individual tag on a bird or a ring on its uh, ankle. Um, but the people who do this, <coughs> they really want to avoid being intrusive, because especially for uh, trying to uh, study the, be the, uh, so the, the, the life, uh, the, the behavior of the bird and how it, how it lives its daily life, it's really best to, to be as unintrusive as possible. And the problem is that uh, you, you really can't... Uh, it's, there are, there are documented ways in which catching a bird and putting a ring on its ankle actually changes its, its behavior. The, the encouraging thing is that a lot of birds do have an individual signature that, that human listeners, for example, can tell the difference between birds in a lot of songbird species. And so, in order to do this work, uh, a lot of the time uh, what will happen is, this is uh, meant to be an audio signal, by the way, so this is, this is the sound recording going along, and uh, the way it works to do this kind of work is you will take uh, a long audio recording and then you snip it to the, uh, the, the, the sound of interest, and then this is the thing that you want to classify or categorise. The bird ID in, in, this, uh, in, in most scenarios is a, is, a, is a categorical label. So it's, I mean, you can argue that it's the same task as species classification. We've, got, we've basically just got a set of labels in order to say which is the most likely label for this particular bird. Um, yeah, so formally it's the same as uh, species classification. <laughs> uh, it's uh, a bit more of a problem though because, uh, well, especially with territorial birds which stay in the same location uh, throughout a season. Um, if we've got bird A and bird B, here are the two audio files, one with bird A and one with bird B. Uh, the problem is not just that we have bird A and bird B, but we also have the background sound of bird A and bird B. And those background sounds have, uh, uh, they co-vary with the, uh, the sound of the bird, just because of the, uh, uh, because of the territorial effects. This isn't so much of a problem with species recognition, for example, because we have a large collection of, of sounds that come from different territories, and so uh, the effect kind of washes out. For, for individual bird ID, it's, it's, uh, it's quite clearly a problem even before we go and record, we can, we can tell. So, uh, working with a particular ornithologist, we wanted to kind of get some idea of how, how much is this a problem. And one thing we can do is we can make use of silence. This is uh, partly why I was showing you this example here. So we record, we record the bird sounds and we, we throw away the silent bits on either side. Um, it turns out that these, these uh, the, the bycatch, the throwaway recording, is actually quite useful because we can take a training set like this, distinguishing between bird A and bird B, um, and we can put together a testing set in which we don't have any of bird A and bird B, but we do have their uh, natural environment. Uh, straightforward question, how, how well can we discriminate between bird A and bird B, even when they're not making a sound in the environment? If we can, then it's a problem. And uh, the area under the curve uh, statistic uh, has chance at 50% and ideal performance at 100%. Uh, our standard kind of recognition process gets um, an error under the curve of 90-something percent, which is great, very encouraging. Um, if we test it with silence, we're getting 60 percent. And a lot of people would say, well, you know, 60 percent, so it's not actually, you know, it's not too bad. It's not, um, it's not getting, uh, it, the difference between these shows that there is, uh, at least in the, uh, it shows in the standard scenario, that quite a lot of the signal or the information that's coming through is coming from the bird signal itself. At least we can argue that. Um, but but this this sort of compo this this component coming from the science, we it, it's a problem. We can't exclude this uh, the, the probability that if our bird classifier is going to is, is firing, saying here's bird here's bird B here's bird C, we really want to be sure that that it's be, it's because of that. 
And, uh, and this is just a warning sign. It doesn't matter that it's down at 60%, it's still a warning sign. And it's, it's very difficult to make, um, sort of take that forward uh, without being able to address this. Uh, so, is there a horse? There is a horse, but there's a, there's a little horse here. Um, there's an analogy which some of you might be familiar with, which is in music information retrieval. If you're trying to uh, detect, if you're trying to tell, if you're trying to identify the artist of a piece of music, the training set you might have Madonna and Michael Jackson. Um, take a single of those and a single of those, and then in the testing set, if we can identify Madonna and Michael Jackson, then yeah, maybe it's doing well. Maybe it's actually identifying the artists themselves. Um, these particular tracks, if you know them well, you might see that there's a problem. The problem is that they, the, the, album, the, the singles uh, actually come from the same album. So, so these two Madonna songs share the same um, producer, the same production, um, a lot of the same production techniques, the same instrumentation maybe, same for the Michael Jackson ones. So um, this was a problem that was identified, I think, more than 10 years ago now in music information retrieval. Um, uh, and it was, uh, once this problem was spotted, the, what, what was... Uh, believed to be the, the recognition accuracy and artist identification suddenly sort of fell off a cliff because if you can filter out this effect you find um, that uh, it's taking you into horse territory and uh, uh, not, not uh, yes, not doing what you expected. Uh, so for territorial birds, the territory is the album. Uh, what I'm going to show you here, just the, uh, a, a study with uh, s different birds, but I'm just, just concentrating on the purple lines. The, the upper purple line, getting accuracy of 90-something percent, is when we take um, a, a bird called the chiff chaff, and we're, identi we're classifying between, I think, 12 different individuals. Um, and we take recordings from one day and we, as the training set and recordings from, uh, I think, the next day as the testing set and we get a performance of 90-something percent. Seems really encouraging. Uh, until we do it across year instead of across days. So uh, the same season but the next year, and the recognition rate's gone down to 60%. So we've got two different indicators that, that there's something of a problem with this. Firstly, that the accuracy uh, really degrades when we're now in mismatched conditions because the territory uh, is, is uh, sort of changing its acoustic characteristics. Uh, and also the silence test. So we're looking at what we're looking at is we want practical ways to fix this. I actually don't really want um, a, a weird new classifier that sort of builds in some uh, some strange loss function. Uh, what would be preferable would be to have some practical ways that I can recommend to people, uh, to practitioners who want to use machine learning technology to do this uh, to do this kind of work. What can they do? Um, Something that's increasingly common in machine learning is data augmentation. So you take your training set and you sort of uh, just just you, you apply procedures to sort of transform it into a larger data set. Uh, in in audio, it's great because you can do audio mixing. You take two audio files and you simply mix them together. And as long as you know what the um, the label of the resulting audio file should be, then you have more data. Um, here we're going to do something slightly different just by, um, so we take a recording of bird B and we actually add some background from bird A. And so that's going to create an audio file which should be labelled as bird B. But it's a, uh, if, the, if the sort of silence effect is, is happening then we should be able to measure sort of the distractibility of the classifier. So over, uh, over the whole collection we should be able to measure how much does adding some silence, um, well, I say silence, but you know, obviously it's not literal silence, um, how much does that affect the, uh, the classifier decisions? Um, this is, uh, yeah, and so, we, so we, we can look at that just by looking at the confusion matrix. How much does uh, the mass in the confusion matrix move around, essentially? Ah, yes. Okay. So the, so the results of that kind of um, the distractibility test I'll show you in a second. The other couple of things we can do with silence are we can then try and use that to uh, improve classification and by data augmentation in the training set. This is pretty common, but in, 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 this, uh, in this work with bird sounds, it's, it's, it's just happy that we have uh, 
So for bird B, we have some background from bird A, we have some background from bird C. If we mix all this stuff together, we're creating a larger data set in which the, uh, the covariance between this, the, the, the foreground and the background is, is starting to be washed out. There is no guarantee that we're completely washing out the covariance. I mean, this is, this is something I must admit. The point here is to, is to try and come up with methods that, 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 that uh, even if they can't give us complete guarantees, they give us something we can evaluate and that we can recommend uh, to practitioners. So, we're making a larger data set in which there is a reduced uh, covariance co co from the compounds. And finally, the other thing we can do with silence is actually classify it as being silence. Okay, this is, uh, this is straightforward and pretty obvious, um, but if we, take, if we take all of these things and just put them all into one pot and say this is a, this is a, uh, a wastebasket class that just contains silence, that's straightforward. Um, but what I want to do in terms of analysing this is not say, can it identify silence? Let's say, when it's identifying these things, I will say, I know you think it's silence, but if it was a bird, which bird do you think it is? And so the idea here is that uh, we want to suppress this kind of, um, uh, the, the, f for a silent uh, clip, we want to suppress the ability to, we want to suppress the tendency to identify it as being the bird uh, with which it's associated. Okay, so the results. Um, the, the, the plot here shows the distractibility that I told you about. So it's the, it's the mean squared error, the, sorry, the root mean squared error of the uh, decisions, uh, how, the, how much they change once you add these kind of attempted distractors to the, to the, to the testing set. Um, and the main story here is the difference between the top two lines and the bottom two lines uh, is simply the presence of augmentation. So this, this augmentation which tries to wash out the difference, uh, sorry, wash out the correlation between the uh, foreground and background uh, gives us quite a strong reduction in the root mean squared error. Um, and that combined with adding this, uh, this background class, so I said that we have this, uh, this wastebasket class added to the data set, that doesn't give us a massive difference in the RMS error, but what it does do is if we put these things together, we end up we can push this down empirically to get 50% error into the curve, which is reassuring. This is all very empirical. This is not based on uh, a, a change in the classifiers, but this is something that we can um, something that we can now be more confident that the uh, the headline result in terms of how well we identify the bird, we can be much more confident that it's a, a generalizable um, result. So, to conclude, uh, as I said, bird sounds outdoor are difficult to analyze, partly because of all the other factors going on there, and partly because the, uh, the, the signal itself is really varied and very hard to uh, sort of define the edges of the, of the class. Um, it's difficult for black box machine learning, and it's an open question how far we can go with it. Um, I've talked about two things in particular. Um, the bird audio detection challenge, where uh, we throw really, uh, we, we got large benefits from testing things in, in strongly mismatched conditions. Um, very satisfied with that. Uh, and then the second part was recognizing individual birds, where we found that the silence was surprisingly useful for audio recognition. Um, Stepping back a little bit, I'm very uh, I, I, I'd be interested to talk today about um, uh, the pros and cons of matched and mismatched conditions in when you're evaluating uh, algorithms and, and procedures. Uh, and finally, just to thank the collaborators, so they're listed above for these two projects, uh, and also to thank the Machine Listening Lab, who uh, Bob mentioned earlier, is that's the context within which we're doing this work. So thank you.